Hi everyone. Uh, firstly, I'm so sorry about um, some of the link issues we've just encountered. We had like a technical error just as we were about to hit go. So thank you so much for those of you that followed through to the new link. Uh, for those of you that have, welcome. This is the third in Shared Buy's expert sessions. I'm Jade from Shared Buy, and I will shortly be handing over to Alex and Lauren from Savills and David here from Sensio Financial, who will be talking all about affordability and kind of buying a home through shared ownership and helped buy. Uh, before that, a little bit of housekeeping. For those of you who have been joining us each week, you're going to know this bit already. So uh, you feel free to tune out for a minute while I talk. But we're going to have our presentations. They'll last generally about half hour. And then after that, we'll go on to a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions along the way, over to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a chat tool in the task toolbar. You can pop any of your questions in there and we're going to try and get through as many as we can um, towards the end of the session. If we don't answer your question, don't worry, we'll be making sure we respond to you or put those kind of FAQs on our website to make sure that you have access to the information you need. Um, also, over on that right hand side, you might as well keep an eye throughout the presentation as well, because other things will be popping up. So kind of um, during Lauren's section on shared ownership, there'll be a downloadable kind of handout about shared ownership. And there'll also be a link to Savills' website with um, links to all of their kind of developments that they have available. Um, but that's it for me for now. So I'm going to turn my video off and hand over to the professionals here, but I'll be back at the end for our Q&A. So I'll hand over to you guys. Hi, um, so my name is Lauren. I work with the Savills Shared Ownership team. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about what shared ownership is, how it works, and really sort of what is going on in terms of now. There's been some changes. Uh, shared ownership viewings are very, very different than they are, ever have been before. Uh, so I'm just going to explain some of that and obviously answer any questions anyone has at the end. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so really the first question that we normally get asked is what actually is shared ownership and why even consider shared ownership in the first place? So shared ownership is a scheme which is introduced to buyers um, that maybe don't have a very large deposit available to them or maybe their income is slightly lower and they have a larger deposit to back up their lower income. Um, but the point of shared ownership really is to buy a percentage of a property the typical minimum is 25%. You can buy anything up to 75% now. Um, and then the aim is to buy slowly to eventually reach 100% instead of putting a large amount of money up, up front. Uh, so the aim is really to just assist you and slowly get to, to a long-term goal within a shorter period of time. So Savills is obviously one of the uh, largest developers and um, estate agents within London um, and outside, well, within most but within England really and what Savills is offering is um, shared ownership is a new section within Savills and they have they're working either directly with the developer with the housing association or directly with the local council um, to offer shared ownership properties with existing um, shared ownership experts. So I myself have been with Savills for two years, uh, but I've been working in the shared ownership department for five years already. So you'll find that anyone you speak to or any questions you ask uh, will be answered in, in extensive detail and with a great amount of knowledge. Who can benefit from shared ownership? This is a question we get asked a lot. Uh, we get asked whether people are, uh, if there were previous homeowners before, if they're eligible for shared ownership. We get asked whether or not um, a deposit is uh, small enough or enough or, or needed at all, whether you can buy the share outright. Um, the, the short answer is there's no easy way to answer this because shared ownership is dependent on your own individual circumstances. Uh, you can buy a property if you've gone through a relationship breakdown. So even if you have owned a property before, you're still eligible for shared ownership. Uh, that's something not a lot of people actually know. Um, but the main rules, uh, you can see them now on the screen. You do have to be over the age of 18. You can't earn more than 90,000 for the household within London. So that's if you're buying with your partner jointly, you can't earn over 90,000 um, or 80,000 outside of outside of London. So the rest of the country, um, you do have to be living in the property. So it does have to be your registered property of address. It is incredibly easy to buy shared ownership. Um, I bought a shared ownership property myself. Um, it was very easy for me to actually do. Um, even even having worked in the shared ownership team, I found it extraordinarily easy because once you find a sales consultant and a property that you like, uh, then the rest 
pretty much just happens. Uh, you're advised on what you need to do at all points of your sale. Um, and if anything, I actually find it's easier than buying outright because you have more assistance. You, you are given so much help from financial advisor, your solicitor, your sales consultant, uh, even just being able to go into chat and talking to a company like Share to Buy and all the information they offer you on actually buying a shared ownership property. Uh, it's, it's just the amount of information is just incredibly, incredibly large. What I would really say from, from the slide that you're seeing on the screen now is the financial documentation. Do start to get that together. Uh, to try to get that list uh, of documentation that you'll need as soon as possible, especially now because uh, a lot of people are working from home. They don't have access to printers, scanners, things like that. It might take that bit longer to get all the documentation together. Uh, so just the sooner you start, the better. So these are literally the four steps uh, that you would go through when buying a shared ownership property. property. Uh, you step on would be reserve, uh, very simple, carrying out a viewing, calling up, speaking to a sales consultant, asking any questions you might have about the property beforehand, uh, accepting the offer. Once you've attended a viewing virtually or in person, then you can um, attend the viewing, ac ac accept the offer after you've attended the viewing, etc. Uh, buying the home you'd get a memorandum of sale and typically 28 days to exchange and complete uh, from the date of the memorandum of sale. And then Sephora is complete. You meet the same sales consultant, uh, whoever that is would be there with you throughout the whole process. And then to tie it all up, you actually get to meet them again in your property on your completion day. Um, and really sort of just, just enjoy the fact that you've sort of gone, gone on that journey with the sales consultant. Uh, a lot of questions I get asked are about the costs as well. Um, the deposit I had when I bought a shared ownership property was only actually 7,000. So it was a 5% uh, deposit. So 5% of the share I was buying. Uh, so it was actually only 7,000. That, that was all I needed. Um, aside from my deposit, there were some costs. Uh, these are laid out on pretty roughly what it cost me when I was buying that. So very, very first hand idea of what the costs are. Um, I always advise to keep aside about 2,000, 2,500 aside, uh, so together with your deposit, uh, to go through all the other expenses. And that includes everything from the reservation fee uh, all the way up to uh, the completion and the moving costs. The only um, fee which isn't listed here is the stamp duty fee. Uh, because that is dependent on the full market value of the property. You would need to speak to a solicitor or a financial advisor as well about the stamp duty um, because it does depend on uh, a number of different things, whether you're a first time buyer, what the full property value is, uh, and so many different things that what you actually pay is very, very individual. So please do reach out uh, and speak to a, a sister or financial advisor about that. But that is payable up to 28 days after your completion day. Not a lot of people know that. So that is something you might want to keep in, in mind uh, when you are looking at buying your first home. In terms of the current market, uh, can you still attend a viewing? Very much so. Um, we have actually commenced viewings um, from the 13th of May onwards. Um, I myself actually have a full day of viewings this coming Friday and Saturday. Uh, all sales consultants are very much back to work. Um, we do offer virtual viewings before uh, the actual physical viewing day and even on the physical viewing day if you do feel unsafe or unsure or, or not interested to attend you can still carry out a virtual viewing in that time so that you've allotted yourself um, as you can see again a number of factors to keep in mind on carrying out viewings um, we are very very strict on these so if any of these are not adhered to on the viewing day unfortunately the viewing will not go ahead so please do keep in these in mind uh, your viewing confirmation will also lay out uh, these important points to you um no more than two persons on a viewing but that does include the sales consultant so that means per household only one person can attend and uh, that person does have to be over the age of 16. Uh, no one under the age of 16 under any circumstance will be allowed on a viewing uh, after every individual viewing, so after every one hour, the sales consultant wipes down all surfaces, cleans through the flat, etc. Uh, and at the end of every single viewing day, uh, all the apartments do get deep cleaned every single time. So we are keeping it very, very safe. Even in terms of contact, uh, you would only speak to a sales consultant outside of the apartment and two meters apart. So you do only go into the apartment on your own. So do make sure that 
you take up the opportunities available to you now, such as the videos on the flat. So you don't feel rushed and you do feel prepared. You do know what you're going to ask the sales consultant when you're there. And obviously, even following the viewing, you can still arrange a virtual call again with the same consultant to ask any other questions you have. Um, so it's very much not the end of the line. You're not sort of left hanging or anything like that. And if anything, I find it more personal because it's literally just you and the sales consultant there on the day. So there's not a lot of confusion. There's not 10 other people there at the same time. You know, what you're actually getting is a very, very personalized uh, and helpful advice really from, from a sales consultant that's there with you on the day. Um, the current market again, why should you buy now? Um, a lot of developers, housing associations, etc., have actually put the sale of their property is on hold due to the lockdown and due to the current situation but now that that's being lifted and the restrictions are being lightened slightly you'll find that a lot of developments that were due to launch in the past two months were put on hold and are now coming back to sale on the market so there's a lot more opportunity a lot more availability and it's much easier for you as a buyer now to narrow down which properties you're interested in by taking advantage of the virtual viewing, the videos, you know, the one-to-one -one sales consultant experience that you do have available to you right now. Um, and a lot of people you'll find are managing to actually save money uh, from the two months that they've been in lockdown because, you know, they're, there's limited to where their money can actually be spent. So they might have found that they've saved, you know, maybe 4,000 in the past two months and can now actually afford the property. Um, so situations have definitely changed in this time, um, but what we're definitely, the message we're definitely sending from Savills is that now is a great time to buy. There's never been more incentives available in the market and um, there's been the most option available to you. And it's more personal. So it's, it's the nicest, uh, in my opinion, way to be buying right now. Um, keeping in mind when you are a homeowner, you do have responsibilities. Therefore, even if you are a shared ownership buyer, you are treated as a full homeowner. So what that means is you're going to need things like contents insurance. You are going to be responsible for a certain number of repairs and maintenance to the property. Um, but what that means on the other, on the flip side of that is that you can go crazy. You can paint your walls purple, pink, you know, all the colors of the rainbow if you want. You can put up every single, you know, picture that you've had since you were two years old. You know, whatever you like, you do have both sides of the coin. Um, and it is nice to know that you're paying into your own mortgage. You're not paying the mortgage of your landlord or, you know, and you have a space that is very much yours. Um, and that feeling is, is really great. You, with shared ownership, uh, a lot of questions we get asked is whether they are leasehold or freehold, and um, they are leasehold. Uh, the reason being, you do pay, buy a percentage of the property, but then you do pay uh, rent on the share that you don't own, and that is paid to either the housing association, developer, or local authority, depends on who you're dealing with. Um, so as a result of that, uh, shared ownership flats are all leasehold properties, uh, and the length of the lease varies between 125 years, 999 years. Again, it's development dependent, um, but of course, as I said earlier, you're treated as a homeowner, so if you want to extend the length of the lease, you have every right to do so. Um, and then looking ahead, buying more shares or selling the property, and um, with shared ownership, you do have to be a little bit clever with the market. You do have to look at uh, whether the house prices are growing, whether they're decreasing. Um, because with shared ownership, when you're looking at buying more shares or selling, it is always going to be based on what the current market value of the property is. Uh, so just to give you an idea, when I bought my property, it was two years ago, it has since gone up by 50,000 since then. Uh, what that means is that I'll be, if I decided to sell now, I'll be selling at what the price today is. So the increase of 50,000. What that also means is if I'm buying more shares in the property, I'm buying with a 50,000 increase as well. So that is something to keep in mind when you are looking at buying more shares in the property, etc. But at the end of the day, your home becomes your asset. Uh, it is something that does belong to you, unlike with just regular market rent properties. Thank you very much. Um, that's all for me. I am available at the end still for questions. Uh, but until then, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague, Alex, uh, in the um, Help to Buy team. She'll be running through a video and running through a similar sort of presentation and be discussing Help to Buy with you. Are you looking
looking to buy a new home for the first time or maybe upsize, but you're struggling to save up. At Savills, we understand. The Help to Buy scheme is one way to make it easier to get on the property ladder. Last year, we helped thousands of buyers. If it's your first step on the property ladder, the process is not always straightforward. The Help to Buy scheme can be used to buy your first property as well as upsize. If you have at least 5% in cash as a deposit, the government lends you a percentage of the purchase price. This is 15% in Scotland, 20% in the rest of the UK and 40% if you live in London. The government loan is interest-free for the first five years. You then borrow the rest from a mortgage. The percentage loan provided by the government must be repaid after 25 years or earlier if you sell your home. Unlike other schemes, when you use Help to Buy, you are the full owner of your property. Your home is 100% yours. The guidelines for Help to Buy are set to change in England in 2021, which will limit the scheme to first-time buyers and there will be a reduction in the value of the property you can buy. If you're thinking of buying or upsizing, take the first step and speak to us today. Savills can help guide you through the process. Hello everyone. Sorry, I just had a bit of technical issues there, but we are back. Um, I, my name's Alex. I'm going to be talking to you about the Help to Buy scheme uh, and hopefully give you a better understanding of what the scheme is all about. So firstly, what is Help to Buy? Help to Buy is a government scheme uh, that allows homeowners to get onto the property ladder by loaning them a larger deposit than what they would previously, um, what, you would, what you would initially have. Essentially, uh, it's a 40% loan to buyers in boroughs of London um, that the government will lend you. And uh, it varies inside London and outside London for the prices. So it's 20% outside of London and other regions that they'll loan you. But uh, if we're, we're talking about London, for example, you'd be looking at 40% loan that the government will, will lend you. In terms of the prices of the property, there is a cap on the property that you can purchase up to £600,000 uh, in London and in various regions it goes from about £260,000 up to about £400,000. So it's best to check um, the Help to Buy website to get an understanding of how much you will be affording in, uh, in the area that you live in. Second of all, how does it work? So essentially I'm going to show you an infographic in a moment but Help to Buy um, is really just a way of, of helping home buyers get on the ladder um, with a traditional mortgage. So you must have at least a 5% deposit. Uh, that is the minimum requirement for to be eligible for help to buy. So 5% of the total property price. Um, and then, as I previously said, the government will then loan you an additional either 20 or 40% uh, towards your deposit. You then get a traditional uh, mortgage on the remainder of the property. So who is eligible? First time buyers are eligible to use this. You must be an owner occupier, so you cannot be buying it as an investment and renting it out to anybody else. Um, but at the moment, if you are a second stepper, so you've bought a flat or a house and you sell that and then the next property you want to buy um, is eligible for help to buy and you'd like to use it, you can of course use it again. Um, you must be a UK resident though, and if, as I said, you have to be an owner occupier. There are changes coming in the next uh, next year, so 2021 you're going to see a change with this um, and it's only going to be eligible to first-time buyers. So why use it? At the moment it's a really good opportunity to, um, to get on the property ladder whilst this scheme is around. It will be changing in the coming, uh, coming 12 to uh, 18 months, so it's a really great time to take advantage of that at the moment. It's going to be your first step onto the property ladder, which is made so much easier if you don't have, you know, you know, you're not reliant on um, on on your family to help out with the deposit, or um, you know, you've come into money some other way. Uh, it's a really good way to get on the property ladder to begin with. Um, it's only eligible on new build properties, so that's really great because you will be the first person to move in. You're going to have a brand new, fresh flat, um, and uh, you know, a lot of the new build properties will will come with, you know. Uh, uh, state of state of the art uh, fitted appliances, and um, you most likely have a balcony, that sort of thing. 
it's not just available on flats um, in London because the property prices are a bit higher a lot of the time you do um, find that you can only maybe afford to buy a flat on help to buy but having said that if you just go a little bit outside London um, surrounding areas like say Boreham Wood for example um, uh, you and a bit further you know like West for example and, and also East maybe in Barking you can be affording um, you can be affording a house as well so it's not just for flats but it does have to be a new build property with a developer so just to um, give you that breakdown of how uh, help to buy works as I said you've got that 5% deposit so say the property price is 400,000 pounds you've saved up 20,000 um, pounds but of course that unfortunately even though it is a lot of money it is not enough to just put down um, to purchase a property so this is where the government steps in they will loan you an additional 160,000 pounds if you decide to take up the full 40% um, and then, of course, from a traditional high street lender, whether it be your bank or building society, they will then loan you um, the additional 55% uh, for your mortgage, making up the whole value of £400,000. Just to give you a bit of an overview on the buying process. So at the moment, things are a little bit different because of uh, COVID-19 and how we can conduct viewings, etc. But, um, you know, a lot of um, the process still remains the same. So at the moment, if you're looking to buy, I would highly, highly recommend speaking to a mortgage broker. Um, independent mortgage brokers are generally what I would recommend so that you don't just go to the one, um, you don't just go to the one lender and only see their rates. If you sort of shop around a bit and that's what an independent mortgage broker will do for you. They'll help you uh, look at lots of different uh, lending options. So once you've spoken to a mortgage broker, you can get an idea of your uh, affordability, how much you might be looking to, to put down for your, for your deposit, as well as how much help to buy you can afford. Um, and then once you kind of have an idea of that, you can really start to narrow down your search. So jumping on uh, websites like Rightmove and Zoopla are really fantastic because you can put in that you are looking specifically for a new home, which will, of course, um, which is only eligible, which is sorry, where help to buy is only eligible on new homes. So make sure that you highlight that you're looking for a new home. Uh, you can also put in the area that you're looking in. For example, um, if you want to look in North London, um, you can you can put in that postcode and, and area. And then, uh, of course, the price, the budget. So you might be putting in 400K as your, your maximum budget and then everything that's a new home um, for sale at the moment. There is normally a little help to buy logo, uh, which was in the previous slide. I'll just go, yeah, the little uh, help to buy logo, which is like the little house. It's it's that blue. If you see that on any property that's um, under six hundred thousand or four hundred thousand uh, in the other regions, then you know that it's going to be help to buy eligible. So once you've had a look online and you might start seeing a few properties that you like the look of, do get in touch with the estate agent who is listing that, and they can help organise a viewing. Uh, at the moment, viewings are sort of we're, we're trying to do as many virtual viewings as possible, uh, whether or not it's, say, for example, I'm going into flats at the moment and just FaceTiming people and buyers saying, look, this is what it looks like until we can get you into the flat. Um, but then others, uh, other developments, we've got um, some uh, better measures in place where we can be a bit uh a bit safer entering flats with people so um, then we can ad adopt some socially distanced viewings in that instance. Of course once you've seen an apartment that you like or a house that you love um, that's when you go to put forward an offer. Uh, sometimes with help to buy you might be looking at offering for the developer to pay stamp duty um, or else like a, a, a little bit of negotiation on the asking price. It varies from development to development so of course just ask your estate, estate agent um, what sort of deals are going on at that development, how flexible the developer is. Once you've um, put in an offer and it's been accepted by the developer, which is super exciting, you will then go on to reserve the property. That's a £500 deposit, um, holding fee rather, that you put down and that goes towards your deposit. So paying that £500 reservation and then filling out the reservation forms, you will have then taken the property off the market and it's reserved for you. From there, you start working through the paperwork. Um, there's a few stages here that 
um, you need to that you need to complete. So you need to fill out with your mortgage broker an authority to proceed, which is getting um, approval from Help to Buy that yes, they will loan you the amount that is required for your deposit. Um, and then you have to also apply to the bank for your mortgage application. Once the mortgage application uh, comes through, your mortgage offer comes through, you uh, will have in this time been hopefully liaising with your solicitor and looking through the lease contract, um, making sure that everything is okay. Once the mortgage offer is through and you're, you're pretty much happy with everything in the lease, you then uh, request from Help to Buy an authority to exchange, but they're happy for you to exchange of contracts on that property. Once you exchange contracts, you have put down a partial um, amount towards the property and agree to complete the full purchase at a later date. Um, sometimes you can do it simultaneously. You might want to exchange and complete at the same time, but uh, essentially you will normally exchange contracts and then maybe 10 days later, if the development is ready to move into, you would then move in and um, the rest of the funds are drawn down from the bank. So that's when you become an official homeowner. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any more questions which we can answer at the end of that because I, I did whip through it quite quickly but um, please do send some, some questions out uh, towards the end and hopefully I can answer them for you for any questions you might have about Help to Buy. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Dave. I uh, work for Sensio Financial. We're specialist uh, affordable housing mortgage uh, brokers. Uh, we do a lot of shared ownership and some help to buy as well. So both the, the things you've just been hearing about. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about now is partly the process, uh, but probably more importantly for you is to look at at what you need to get prepared before you come to see us to arrange the mortgage, just so that when you get to that stage, it's the uh, the, the smoothest process that you can follow. Um, the first time you'll usually come to us is with uh, the, the stage where you're getting assessed for affordability and eligibility. Um, you can do that through our website, and uh, if you go on to Sensio Financial, um, you'll be able to see the, the links to that. Uh, and what we do then is we look uh, to inform the Housing Association or Savills um, as to your eligibility so that they're at the point where they're prepared to uh, offer you that property knowing full well that you can uh, you can afford to buy it. Um, once you've been offered the property that's when you'll come back to us and the first thing we would do is invite you into a meeting with one of our advisors. Um, that usually lasts about an hour and 45 minutes along those lines um, and you'll leave that meeting hopefully knowing that you've got a decision in principle which I'll talk about a little bit later um, and also uh, having all your questions answered and understanding what the best deal is for you at that stage. Before you come into the meeting we tend to ask you to uh, fill in a questionnaire and the reason we do that before is because we want as much detail as we can get um, so that the advisor in that meeting can give you the best advice possible. Um, we'd also ask you to send us through some documents uh, and again that's so that we are prepared uh, beforehand uh, and I'll talk to you about the reason why we've got those documents uh, in a little while as well. Once the advisor's found the best deal for you they'll give you what's called a uh, key facts illustration or KFI um, and they will run a decision in principle uh, and that's where the lender is just checking uh, on what's sent through to them would they be in principle happy to offer you a mortgage? Um, that's not the point when you've got the mortgage offer, but what it does do is it gives us an initial credit score uh, and tells us that the lender, as long as everything we've put in the application is uh, accurate, um, that the lender will be happy to offer you uh, a mortgage. Um, so the lender then goes through the process of uh, underwriting and they have to underwrite, or underwrite two things. They have to underwrite the property and they ha have to underwrite you as a person. Uh, when it comes to underwriting the property, uh, that involves going out and doing evaluation. And we all know, obviously, that in the in the past few weeks, uh, evaluations haven't been happening. Uh, but I'm pleased to, pleased to tell you that that is starting to happen again, uh, which means that now mortgages are tending to move forward. Um, and that evaluation basically makes sure that the property is worth what you're paying for it um, in the lender's eyes uh, to be sure that, uh, that their money is secure. Uh, they also underwrite you uh, and what they're doing with that in that sense is making sure you who you say you are uh, 
um, then making sure that your income and expenditure is as you have uh, told us and as we have told them in the application. Uh, and the way they do that is by checking the documents that you sent in. So proving income, they'd look at your pay slips, for example. Proving expenditure, they'd look at your bank statements. And that's all about affordability checks to make sure that when you do start to pay the mortgage and rent uh, on the shared ownership property that you can afford to do that for the foreseeable future. Um, obviously, once those two things are done, that's when they send out the offer. And uh, that's the exciting time because that's the point you know 100% that you, you've got the money in place ready to buy the property and when you can hand over to solicitors to arrange for the exchange of contracts. Uh, and then obviously once the, the exchange contracts has happened, the final stage, as we mentioned before, is that you complete, you take your keys to the property, uh, your mortgage gets what's called drawn down, uh, and the money goes over to the housing association and you own that property at that stage. Uh, that's the exciting bit, and that's what we're all aiming to get to. And uh, what we'll talk about later is making that preparation uh, before you come to see us, so that that's as smooth a pro uh, process as possible. Um, just looking at, uh, I've seen some of the questions that have come in previously, and uh, people do ask about uh, what lenders there are in the market. Uh, we've got um, a number of different lenders that we work with. In fact, we work with all the shared ownership lenders. Uh, ranging from the big banks, Barclays, Halifax, TSB, you can see up there, um, all the way down to some of the really small niche building societies that allow us to find people mortgages, even if they don't necessarily fit the criteria of the big banks. Um, so a, a wide range there, and uh, we deal with this uh, across the market, the people who do shared ownership, and specifically with HSBC, who we have uh, an exclusive deal with that we can have access to their deals, uh, and they often have the best rates on the market. So um, that's something we can offer specifically at NCO um, as one of the lenders, whereas other people wouldn't necessarily have been able to do that. Uh, so moving on to the, the big bit really, which is the preparation. Uh, I've mentioned documents a few times, and, and that's the real starting point is to get all the paperwork ready to send across when you found that property. Uh, you have to prove your ID, as I mentioned before, and the best way of doing that is with a passport, but another way of doing that perhaps is with a driving license. Um, and we're moving towards doing electronic IDs for people, especially in these times of COVID, uh, where we can't get access necessarily to scanners and things like that. Uh, we can do electronic IDs having been sent to your um, passport as a photo uh, and we've got a company in the background who prove that uh, you are who you say you are for us. Uh, proof of address, so if you've got a passport and driving license you can use the passport as the ID and you can use the driving license as the proof of address of, as long of course as the address that's on the driving license is correct and I'd encourage everyone to check that uh, nice and early to make sure that you've, you've changed that if you need to. Uh, but other forms of address that you can have would be a council tax bill, a utility bill, uh, as long as it's from within the last three months, or your bank statements uh, should have the address on the top of them as well. Again, as long as it's within the last three months, that would count. Uh, and if there's two of you applying, we'd need the same from both, obviously. Um, we mentioned before that the lender would underwrite you uh, and look at your income. Uh, two different types of employment. Uh, employment really you've got your employed people and for those people we definitely need the last three months pay slips um, and if you earn extra for example overtime or bonuses or things like that um, then we may actually ask you for more than that as well so perhaps the last couple of years p60s uh, or also your last pay slips that have got bonus payments on them so it might be that you get it annually uh, maybe in January um, so we might ask for the last three months and last January and the January before to see and prove what your bonus uh, was at those times. If you're self-employed, if you're a sole trader, then usually your SA302s and your tax year overviews are the way that uh, the lender would ask um, us to prove your income. And you can get them from the HMRC, so you can actually log into HMRC and uh, download them directly from that website or perhaps you have an accountant who can do that for you uh, instead. If you're uh, a director of a limited company, then we would need to look at last year's accounts, and usually three years accounts is, is what the lender would be looking for, 
although not necessarily, sometimes it is possible to do it on less than that. Um, so loads and loads of documents there um, in terms of income and expenditure. Uh, finally, we do also have to prove where your deposit is coming from. Um, now, lots of people get concerned, I think, that, that they're worried if their deposit comes from a gift. Um, but I, I would say probably the vast majority of first time buyers, that's where it comes from, usually from parents. Um, but it can be from blood relatives as well. Uh, and what we would need is proof that the money has come from your parents and that the money um, is a gift rather than a loan, i.e. Um, they're not expecting anything back or any ownership of the property. Uh, and we would do that via a gifted deposit letter and via showing the, the money in their bank account or the transfer from their bank account to yours. Uh, so that's all the documents that we would ask for uh, and generally would be required. Um, and what I would say is it's a good idea to get those all prepared now. Um, so before you find a property, have those in a folder on your computer ready to send through to us um, so that as soon as that appointment is booked with the mortgage broker, um, that they can see the information and give you the best advice as quickly as possible. Um, other things that it makes sense to check as well. So your credit score. Um, there are lots of uh, options out there for getting a free credit score uh, and downloading a credit report. And I'd encourage everyone to do that, whether you're buying a property or not, to be honest with you, because uh, sometimes the data that is on those credit reports is incorrect. Um, there may be a loan that, that shouldn't be on there or actually vice versa, there may be something that should be on there that isn't. Um, and it's not as though you can't change those. If you notice something wrong on your credit report, um, get in touch with the, the company that, you're, that has done the report, talk to them about what should be on there or the, uh, the things that are perhaps wrong uh, and get that right because that's one of the things the banks will look at when you, you put your application for your mortgage in. Uh, another thing is just getting all your addresses lined up. So uh, whichever property you're in at the moment, get the electoral roll updated to say that that's where you live. And the most common thing we see, I would say, is people who have the bank statements still in previous addresses, probably most commonly from students who've gone away to university. They've left their bank account in their parents' name. And then even five, six, seven years down the line, it's still in their parents' uh, address. Sorry, not their parents' name, but in their parents' address. So you can go on to your uh, online banking, uh, check, check that they're correct, look at your bank statements, and you can always change them. Uh, usually online. So um, by having all those things uh, ducks in a row, as it were, uh, when the lender does come to do the credit score, all those things will improve your chances of passing the credit check that they do at their loans. Uh, quite a lot of things to do, I understand, but uh, the more of them you can get ready, the better. Um, in terms of doing the initial assessment, as I said, you, you can use our website. So uh, we've got a lot of digital channels that you can have a look at. Um, but the website's got the access onto the um, portal to do those assessments on. Um, but also, I think it's been said before by both, uh, both of the colleagues who were on beforehand, um, the best thing to do is ask questions. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to answer your questions uh, whenever you've got them uh, and support you through the process from start to finish. Um, I, think, I think that's it from me. Uh, obviously, I'll be happy with some questions as well. Uh, I'll hand back. Hello. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much, um, David. And thank you, Lauren and Alex, as well. Um, oh, I'm just getting a little bit of technical issues from my end. We're not having a good day on this, guys. I'm so sorry. Thank you to the hundreds of you who are sticking with us despite any of the um, technical issues. But we really appreciate it. Uh, before we go on to the Q&A, I've noticed on the chat section that a lot of people are asking about will they have access to this video after. You will. It will be up on both SharedBy.com and SharedBy's YouTube this afternoon or not long ago, within a couple of hours after this session so if there's anything you've missed or want to go back over we will have it up there for you but for now um we'll get going on the q a section so guys we've had a few people before media and actually during the chat pretty much just asking whether shared ownership will help to buy so do you have any general advice for buyers who are currently having to make that decision Alex, <laughs> should yeah, I, I was, Sorry, <laughs> I was going to say, firstly, um, I guess it just does, uh, you know, if, you, if you're looking at either shared ownership or help to buy, um, one of the main things is going to be affordability. Um, yeah. with, with shared ownership, you, are, you cannot 
earn over it. You can't have more than a certain amount in your household income. So if you're earning over that cap, then of course you might not want to look at, or you won't be able to look at shared ownership. You would have to look then at, to help to buy. But equally, if maybe you don't have such a high deposit, then maybe um, help. Then maybe shared ownership is the option for you. So I think it's um, just about figuring out sort of what works best for you in terms of repayments and and what deposit you can put down and, and what you're most comfortable with. I would definitely just add to that. It does go the other way around as well. So I know with help to buy, the properties I think are only up to six hundred thousand. If yeah. I'm not mistaken, uh, with shared ownership, you can the full market value can be more than that. Um, but then you would just not be able to earn more than 90,000. In the same breath, if you are in a low income household, so I've noticed a couple of the questions we're asking that, uh, you, you can earn very low amounts. So, uh, you know, even initially when I bought, you know, there wasn't very much there either. Um, and what that mean, meant was that it limited where I was looking um, and what I was looking at, but it also, it, on the flip side, you can, um, still have a very, very low income salary, but then your deposit can make the difference. So uh, the, the usual figure, uh, and I think uh, Sensio can support this, is for every 1,000 on the advert, you're under in the income, you'd need about 3,000 more in deposit, aside from a 5% deposit. So maybe keep that in mind uh, when you're looking at the basic figures, very, very basic figures that you get when you're looking at property adverts. But yeah, that's great. Sorry, David, did you have something to add there? I would say just to have a look at both of the calculators, um, put your details into both uh, and see what comes out um, and then ask questions. So by, by all means, get in touch with us and say, look, I, I pass on this, but I don't pass on that. Um, how could I how could I change my, my pass rate? Um, exactly. But do both. Have a look at both. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's such an individual thing, isn't it? It's not, it's, there's not a blanket response to anyone. It's like you guys have all just said, it's about figuring out what works best for you. So that's great. Uh, we have another question for you, David, actually. Shanice has asked, will being employed on a fixed term contract affect getting a mortgage? Uh, so that probably raises more questions than it answers, I, I would think. But <laughs> um, it, it depends on a number of factors. So the answer, the simple answer is no, it won't stop you getting a mortgage. Um, but the lender will look at another uh, few factors. So, for example, uh, how many times is your fixed term contract being renewed? How long is left on your fixed term contract? Um, it, sometimes it affects you uh, which uh, type of employment you're in. So, for example, IT contractors tend to be uh, well thought of by lenders. They tend to offer more like uh, um, with less of a history of contracting beforehand. But it, the simple answer is it won't. Um, or shouldn't do if you've got a bit of a history of it. Okay, fantastic. And our next question is from Leo. Lauren, this might be one for you more in the kind of shared ownership section. Um, it's regarding staircasing. So for those that um, are tuning in now and don't know what that term is, that's basically the process of buying more shares. Uh, yeah. Leo has asked, is it difficult to staircase to 100% ownership in a shared ownership property? No, it's not difficult. Um, you do have to keep in mind, and definitely a question to ask when you're on your viewing, is how many times do you need to staircase to get to 100%? Now, the reason I say that is specific housing associations only allow you to staircase three times aside from your initial purchase to get to 100%. So please very much keep that in mind. Um, but otherwise, you can buy as little as 1% in the flat uh, to as much as... 100% from 25%, so from your initial share. Uh, and you can buy as quickly as possible. Uh, within six months of you having been in the property, you might suddenly have inheritance or a sudden amount of wealth that you don't know what to do with. There's, and and on this, in the same breath, no one will ever come around and knock on the door and say, oh, you've been in your flat for two years now, you've been in that for too long, you need to move out. You know, no one's going to do any of those things. You know, you can pass it on to your kids and your kids' kids' kids and, you know, all of that would be fine. Um, so just things to keep in mind. Um, it's very, very easy to do. Just please ensure that you are keeping things like the three times to get to 100% in mind um, and making sure that you're buying at a time that is right for you and is affordable for you. Uh, if your fixed term on your mortgage is coming to an end, you might want to look at buying more shares at that time to get a new fixed rate. Um, you know, just just a couple of things like that. Keep in touch with your financial advisor. The initial conversation with Sensio is actually free to have, not just Sensio, with any financial advisor, the initial chat is free. Uh, so why this isn't being done, if you're even slightly unsure about your affordability, 
you know, I'm unsure because the the, the help is there. Uh, so please just reach out and ask because we're we're very very keen to help. Fantastic. And going back to you, David, uh, Ravimbo has asked, can you borrow the deposit from a bank or is it solely from your savings when buying? Um, so the simple answer is there is one lender out there that may look at you if you have borrowed the money from somewhere else. So as in the deposit is a loan rather than that gift. Um, but uh, what I would say uh, sort of counterbalance to that is that the likelihood is that if you're at that stage of affordability where you need to borrow the loan as well, um, it is quite likely that you might not be able to be eligible with that one particular lender. So the, the goal of a mortgage broker, I would say, is to keep as many lenders in the pot as they can. So the fewer things that would restrict that pot, um, the better, because that way you get access to the best rates on the market. So you may end up paying a little bit more for your mortgage if you borrowed it. And I would say that the, I know that saving the deposit is the hardest bit probably, um, but uh, by by putting that into that effort into saving the deposit, you will end up with a far better product in the long term. Okay, so more options. It kind of opens yeah. up opens the market up to you a little bit more. So that's good to know. Um, we've also had a few people getting in touch, pretty much asking about the types of properties that are available through shared ownership and help to buy. Uh, like specifically, I think there's sometimes a misconception about what is available in one and what's available in the other. So, ladies, would you mind yeah. giving us a bit of a idea? Yeah. I'll, um, I'm happy to start that off. So, with shared, uh, with shared ownership, with help to buy, <laughs> um, you can only use help to buy on a new build. So um, it has to be not lived in before and the developer has to have applied for um, for using the help to buy scheme. So um, even if the, the building is like five years old, the, uh, the freeholder of the building or the developer won't have help to buy on that. So it is essentially just anything that is brand, brand new, uh, the developer has to have applied for help to buy funding from the government and is approved for it. Um, but you know, having said that, it could you could use it from anything from a um, from a studio flat in central London, if uh, if you know if if that's available, up to a um, standalone freehold house outside of London. Um, I've, I've got a, f a friend that has that bought a two bedroom flat in London, and another friend that bought a three story four bedroom house on Help to Buy outside of London. So you can um, it's just as long as it's new and, and through a developer that is applied for help to buy, you can buy what you can afford there. Uh, so with shared ownership, um, pretty much everything that Alex just said about um, new build sale applies to shared ownership as well. Um, as long as the developer or housing association has applied for it to be a shared ownership property, uh, then it remains as a shared ownership property for that property's existence or unless the, the buyer buys up to 100%. What that means is, uh, if I want to sell my property, uh, if I only own 25% of it, I need to sell the 25%, so I'm selling a share. Um, however, you can, you do then have the option to sell that property directly with the housing association as a shared ownership property. If the housing association doesn't manage to sell the property within the first eight weeks, then you do have the opportunity to then go and sell on the open market. So you can then sell to uh, to anyone, to uh, the 100% to an investor, still sell it as a shared ownership property. You can sell it with an estate agent. Uh, you can sell it, uh, stay selling it as a shared ownership property with your housing association, whatever suits you. Um, but then what that means is if you are selling uh, on to another shared owner, then they're going to buy your share for sure, whether that's 25, 35, 45, 50, uh, 15, 20, you know, whatever your share is, uh, has to be bought and um, plus whatever that new buyer is affordable for. Um, but whatever you've put in, whatever share you've put in, whatever share you own at that time, you will get back directly. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to know there as well, that it's not just on new builds for shared ownership. Exactly. There are also resales. sales. So exactly that, if you decide to exactly. sell property and during your uh, nomination period with your housing association, they sell it, then that's being bought potentially by another owner, your property becomes a resale. So it's, it's good to know because actually not everyone wants a new build, not everyone wants a, a, a second-hand home basically, it's very yeah. much a personal thing. 
So exactly, yeah. those kind of options there for buyers. So that is fab. I think that's yeah. clear what you've both just given us there. There are there are actually so many different options because you can get uh, just a regular new build shed ownership, uh, what we do call a resale, uh, and what we call a rent to buy, um, which actually my property was uh, initially. So a rent to buy unit is a flat that was finished with a rental standard. Uh, but the lease was flipped to become a shared ownership property uh, so that person can buy the property now uh, as a shared ownership flat. Uh, so what it means is the lease is new, but the flat is new and the inside is very much like a rental property. What that means, however, though, is that typically the full market value of those kinds of flats are lower. Uh, so it's sort of like the best of both worlds and uh, yeah, very much dependent on your own individual circumstances. That's great. So there's so many options as yeah, well. It's exactly. not, not so black and white, is it? There's yeah. definitely that kind of grey area where you can do some yeah. research. Uh, back to David for this one, I imagine. So a few people have asked about um, the payments on a help to buy a home after that first five year interest free um, comes to an end. Do you have any information on that? Uh, yep. Yeah. So during that first five years, you don't pay anything to uh, have that equity loan. Uh, in the sixth year, you'll pay 1.75% of what that loan uh, was, and that's spread evenly between the 12 months. So it becomes a monthly payment to the government. Um, from year seven onwards, that payment does go up, uh, and it goes up by RPI plus 1%. But that's only, it only RPI plus 1% of the 1.75 that you were paying before. So, for example, if you're um, payment in year six was 150 pounds. In year seven, I would expect it's going to be in the region of a 160 pounds. So it, it doesn't go by, by all that much, but the starting point is 1.75 percent. Okay, fab. And sticking with you, David, we have actually a question from David, which um, not yourself, I imagine. Uh, pretty much saying I have savings but a relatively low income. Would I be able to buy a share outright on a shared ownership property rather than take out a mortgage? Uh, so. The rule is that you have to buy the highest percentage that you can can afford. Uh, so if your income is enough, uh, given your outgoings, to afford a mortgage, then uh, the rules would state that you could afford higher than just your deposit in terms of percentage, and therefore, yeah, yes, you would need to get a mortgage. Uh, there are, are a very few um, uh, situations where that's not the case. So it's not 100% of the time, but as a general rule, that's, that's where it would be. Yeah. Okay, fab. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. So um, I'll shoot one over to you, Alex, in the meantime. Uh, yeah. So June Ann and a few others actually have been asking about the potential extension of help to buy after 2021. And if you think there will be a replacement, how much do we know about that at the moment? Yeah, of course. Great question. Well, um, after 2021, um, well, next year, we're going to be seeing quite a few changes with help to buy. It's been around uh, since I think it was 2003 now. I might have that wrong, but I'll just double check. But yeah, um, I mean, it's been around for a long time and, and it will be something that does have to come to an end. There are talks and speculation as to what might replace Help to Buy, but at this point in time, we don't really know exactly what that might be. Um, obviously, we know that there are the changes coming in that you can only be a first time buyer as of next year. Um, and the different caps and, and thresholds and things. But, you know, we're hoping that the government has got something else in place that might be able to replace that or just like a, a, a similar but slightly different different scheme um, because it is something that has been incredibly popular. It's being used all the time. It's really helping people get on the property market um, and it's great for for using on, on new homes, which is we know that... Um, Homes England needs to needs to be uh, to be building more more properties um, each year. So, short answer is no. We don't know what's coming, um, but we should have more clarity. There's there's lots of speculation as to what it will be, but at the at the moment it's, it's kind of a really good opportunity to take advantage of help to buy whilst um, whilst we've got it. Yeah, great. Um, we've also had quite a few questions in about lodges. Um, so both coming through about shared ownership and help to buy, and whether you can actually have lodges um, in with you in your property. So with help to buy, um, you know, if you've got, if you've purchased a, a two bedroom, uh, two bedroom flat and you're obviously only going to be using one of those bedrooms, you can get a lodger in. Um, they're not going to be, they, they're obviously not going to be on the, on the mortgage, but um, they can contribute to your mortgage payments, but you can't, you have to still be living in the flat and, um, and paying that. You cannot just have um, you can't move out at all and, and have anybody renting it. So if you do have someone in there that's living with you that might be helping with the mortgage payments, 
like say a friend or something that's something that's possible but um mm -hmm. yeah lodges is okay but you just definitely can't rent it out it's the same with shared ownership you can't have a formal agreement uh with someone to uh rent the second room <laughs> out uh, what that means is it has to be someone you know, uh, someone that's sort of happy with a bit of an informal agreement. Uh, but otherwise, yes, you're very much allowed a lodger with shared ownership as long as it's a two-bedroom property. Um, yeah, otherwise, it's, uh, you're very much allowed to do that. So it's as long as you're staying as that owner-occupier, you're not moving exactly. out and you can have exactly. someone move in. So that's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. On, the, on the flip side as well, a lot of people are asking, you know, what if I have to go away for work for two months or three months or whatever, can someone be staying in the flat while I'm gone? Uh, the answer to that is very much also yes, as long as it remains your primary resident residency uh, and you also let the housing association know that someone else will be there within the three months that you aren't there, um, just in case anything happens, if there's a leak or anything, you know, that's you that they're going to be trying to reach at the end of the day and it is your property, you're the homeowner. So uh, just taking that sort of level of responsibility, um, but otherwise, yeah, the options are very much there. I think, I think it might be important to add, sorry to butt in, but um, the... Uh, calculator from the government and the lender will take the affordability only on the person one person's income yeah. so yes. even if you plan to have that person in from the start and they're paying 300 pounds a month or whatever that wouldn't count towards the affordability for the mortgage you'd need to be able to afford it on your own yeah that's really important to know actually that they can be there but you still need to be able to afford the property without their kind of um, input that's great so just before we kind of round up um a few people have been asked where they can access some of your developments um, on Savills. So pretty much if anyone that's watching, you can click on the offers button to the right. There's a link through to Savills' website. But um, Alex and Lauren, do you want to tell us about where you have some of your kind of help to buy and shared ownership properties? Of course. So with um, the help to buy properties, we've got them all over London and also outside of London in various counties. Um, for example, obviously myself, I, I work in London, so I'm, I'm more familiar with the market there. But um, Savills have got properties in East London, South London. We've got, um, you know, talking to people today, I've been talking to people about uh, development in Holloway. Um, we've also got things over in Hayes uh, and, and as well as Kew. Um, but then there's the odd shared ownership property as well. Uh, not the odd help to buy property. Um, sorry, Lauren. Um, the odd help to buy property as well that we've got, like, say, in the southwest suburbs too. So um, we do have a whole lot of different schemes. We've got um, a property portfolio, which is the Savills property portfolio. Um, I've shared it on my LinkedIn recently, um, and I'm sure a few other colleagues have too, but it's also available on our website. That goes through every new build development that we've got from the residential development sales team. Um, and anything on there, there's a section in there, I think, for shared ownership. And then, of course, um, if there's the help to buy a logo on that um, that development, you'll you'll know that that's something that you can, you can inquire about. Um, also, just on that, we've also got a help to buy buyer's guide that we put together to give people an idea of the process and how, um, how help to buy works and how you can purchase your home. So if, um, if that's something that you're after as well, please do, um, do get in touch. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, um, it's the same as shared ownership. So there's not a restriction on where the properties are located. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at uh, the Savills website. All the properties are available there. Um, but also, again, when you do have initial conversation uh, with your sales consultant, let's say you're only sort of looking at properties in, in North London or in East London, you know, ask the sales consultant what's coming up because they might know of a development that's upcoming that might not yet be on the website. So, again, I'm just going to encourage you to please do ask those kinds of questions. Um, please be, be nosy a little bit. Um, and just say, look, this is really the area I'm restricted in. Or maybe it's a budget that you're restricted by. And then the sales consultant might, you know, suggest an area that's more suitable for you. Uh, you know, but um, again, just to go on what Alex was saying, we have properties everywhere uh, from North London to Hounslow, Harrow areas, uh, Isleworth, you know, outside of London, uh, Kent areas, etc. So uh, if we deal with everywhere. Yeah, um, I myself, I'm also sort of located in London. But I deal with a lot of properties uh, in North uh, London, West London as well. Um, so again, just very much, uh, very, very much, please reach out, uh, read the shared ownership uh, guide to buying as well. So similar to the have to buy guide, we do have a shared ownership one as well. 
Um, and also it's important to note that um, there are even things such as reading case studies of previous buyers, which are available on the Savills website as well. Uh, I know they're available on the Share to Buy website also, um, purely because reading people's past experiences, uh, reading testimonies from, from other shared ownership buyers, other help to buy buyers um, may help. You know, you might, you're not the only person, I promise, that doesn't think that uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, so so please do sort of just read through these things. And, and at the very least, you, you'll feel less alone in this, less alone in your buying experience. That's really great. I mean, I think we're going to have to wrap it up now, guys, just because we're yeah. about to go on to the hour mark and we've had you talking for ages. But um, thank you to all three of you. You've been really helpful. I think you've given a lot of information. I know you've actually answered a lot of the questions that have come through. So hopefully people have kind of um, had a chance to digest that. Um, for those of you who didn't answer your questions, I am really sorry. There's, there's, there's been hundreds of them, but the video um, is going to be live. Uh, the, the recording of this session is going to be on YouTube. It's going to be our website. We're also going to send out an email to all of you who have registered with a link to this as well. We're also going to be working through on our website, so on sharedbuy.com, um, a massive kind of Q&A section, which we'll send you a link to once it's updated with the questions that we kind of have scoured through here as well. So give us a couple of days. We'll let you know when that's live and you can probably find the answers to your questions there, or at least quite a few of them. If not, you can get in touch with us. Um, other than that, Thank you again, guys. Thank you to everyone that submitted questions. We will be back on Thursday, the 28th of May. So next Thursday with Peabody, who will be talking about um, shared ownership, help to buy, so covering some similar stuff, but also doing some myth busting and some debunking. So we'll be back, uh, yeah, 28th of May at 6 p.m. Uh, thank you so much again uh, for joining us and for our great speakers. It's been a, a great session. But in the meantime, stay safe and we'll speak to you all soon. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.